thank you very much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for staying for what is not, not quite the graveyard slot, but getting close to it. Um, as Penny said this morning, um, today's actually my first official day back at work after maternity leave, although you'll be relieved to hear I have actually been doing work in the last couple of weeks, so I'm not actually just going to make all this up on the hoof. Um, so this presentation is really a follow-up to a paper that I wrote last year, which was using data from SSA 2011 and 2012 to look at the gender gap and to, to try and understand why it is that women seem less willing than men to embrace independence. And the persistency of that finding means that women have really have become a big focus of the debate with, with both campaigns now having organisations that are specifically aiming to, to bring their messages to women. Um, and obviously also a lot of debate around how specific campaign promises, for example, around childcare may or may not influence women's votes. So there's three main parts to, to my presentation this afternoon. First of all, I'm going to look at the gender gap in 2014 and how that compares with previous years. Obviously, as Gordon said, John's already given you the headline, but I'm hoping to drill down to that in a little more detail. Um, secondly, um, hopefully goes out without saying that women are, are not a homogenous group. Um, so next I want to look at a couple of findings around which women in particular seem to be more or less in favour of independence and where areas where the gender gap may be slightly uh, less than it is, is overall. And then finally, I want to look at some possible reasons for the gender gap's existence. Um, and here I'm going to revisit some, some themes from my earlier paper and look at really whether women hold different views to men across some of the key areas that we know from John's paper and, and other research seem to influence people's uh, support or not for, for independence. So looking specifically at um, people's views of the consequences of independence, particularly for the economy and for other areas, people's attitudes to the key political figures. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion around Salmond and, and how he goes down or not among, among women. Um, and then um, feelings of, of Scottishness or Britishness, um, which, while not necessarily as central to the debate as, as some people might think, certainly feelings of, of national identity do, do factor into it. And then finally, I'm going to uh, look at some findings, uh, going back to one of the questions that John talked about this morning, around whether women feel more or less sure about what independence might bring and how that might impact on their willingness to, to back it. So first, um, I want to look at the size of the gender gap in 2014. Um, and as, as, as I said, John has already uh, uh, preempted the, the headline on that. But um, what I wanted to do was to look in slightly more detail using the kind of various different measures of support for independence that have been introduced in, in both John and Lindsay and Jan's presentations this morning. So we've got the, the long-standing question, which John talked about at, at, the, at the start, which was the um, five options, which of these statements comes closest to your view about how you'd like Scotland to be governed, and, and uh, first two options, collapse to independence, second two, devolution, third option, no parliament. Then we've got the referendum question, which you can look at with or without the follow-up squeeze question, which, which tries to get those who are currently undecided to say how they think they're most likely to vote. And then finally, the, I call it the new question, it's not that new, I think we introduced it in 2011, which is the, the four option question that, that was in, featured in Jan's slides, which tries to ask people about their constitutional preferences, but without using jargony words like devolution max or even independence. So just a quick reminder of the headline figure, uh, the gender gap is, is, is not new, it has existed um, as far back as, as 1999. Um, and typically around uh, six or seven percentage points between men and women, with, with men more likely than women to say that they, they would support independence. Um, and more men in every year have said that, although in some years, as you'll see, the gap was pretty small and not necessarily statistically significant in every year there. But overall across that period, typically a six or seven percentage point gap. But the gap in 2014 is especially large, so 12 percentage points, which is, is double the six point gap that we recorded in, in 2013. And if you drill down to that, though, and look in a little bit more detail at, at the figures behind that slide, you can see that it's not actually necessarily the case that women are massively more enthusiastic about devolution um, than are men. So um, looking at the, the sort of second set of rows, um, at 52%, the proportion of women who said that, that devolution was their preferred option is only a little higher than the 48% of men who said that. Um, and actually, 52% is is lower than in most other years um, since 2007 for women. So, but they are much more likely to say that they don't know which option they prefer. And actually, the proportion saying they don't know which option they prefer out of those five options um, seems to have increased um, since 
2012. So, uh, so you've got 7% of women in 2012 saying that, 15% saying they don't know which of those options to pick now. So for me, that suggests that one possible impact of the campaign, which is perhaps not a particularly brilliant one, is that it has um, made women less sure if devolution is the best option for Scotland, but, but no more likely to pick independence as an alternative. So it's just made them less, less sure about which of any of these options would be best. And this greater uncertainty among women is also apparent when you put the referendum question to them. So you can see that this is this the initial question before we squeeze people at all. Um, you have 32% of women who say they haven't decided how they're going to vote compared with 25% of men. So actually the 11 percentage point gender gap on the yes vote, which you can see on the left-hand side of this chart, is accounted for by women being a little more likely than men to say that they're going to vote no, so 45% compared with 41% of men, but actually also being much more likely to say that they are, have not decided how they're going to vote yet. And women are more likely to insist that they're undecided even when you do squeeze them in polling terms, even when you do push them on how they're most likely to vote. So you can see from this chart on the right-hand side that half of women who initially say they're undecided still say they're undecided even when you say, OK, but how are you most likely to vote? And that compares with men who split roughly into to three roughly even groups between uh, yes, no, and undecided. Um, this slide is just showing referendum votes after you squeeze people. So this is basically once you, you put the people who said they were most likely to vote yes or most likely to vote no into their respective yes, no columns. Um, and you can see that the gender gap, even when you went after the squeeze, remains 11 percentage points. So it looks like, whatever way you look at it, there is a significant gender gap in terms of, of women and men's attitudes to independence in 2014. And just to say that SSA isn't telling a massively different story to everyone else, um, these slides show estimated yes votes, and this is actually after the don't knows are, are, left, are taken out of the, the, the base, um, for by gender from... Uh, the 40 polls that were conducted between the start of the year and the end of July. I didn't get around to adding in the last few polls from the last week because I had lots of other things to do. Um, but, but having looked at them, they're, they're not painting a significantly different picture either. So, I mean, there have been a couple of polls, it's true to say, most recently ICM in July, when the gap has been insignificant, only a, only a point or two. But that was immediately followed by a panel-based poll that I think put the gap at 14 points. So... Um, over the year since January, the gap has averaged 10 percentage points, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence from the polls that it is narrowing significantly the closer we get to, to the referendum. And just finally, I wanted to take a quick look at, at people's responses to the question which doesn't actually use the language of independence or devolution. And this is, this is the question which just asks people to say which of the Scottish Parliament and the UK government they think should make uh, decisions for Scotland. Um, and you can see that on this question, if you take the columns on the left, which is the people who say the Scottish Parliament should make all of the decisions for Scotland, which might be considered equivalent to independence, um, the gender gap is actually much smaller on that measure than on either the more long-standing SSA question or on uh, referendum vote. And in fact, the gender gap there isn't significant. Um, and I'd be interested in what other people make of this, but one of the things that I was wondering was whether... Um, women are turned off in greater numbers just by the sort of term independence and the, the, you know, the idea of it, but not necessarily um, by the principles of very, very maximal devolution. Um, that's something that perhaps other people might have views on that they can contribute at the end. So just in summary, there's a long-standing and persistent gender gap in support for independence. If anything, it's wider in 2014 than 2013. But that's not to say that women are necessarily very much more pro-union. Much of the gap is accounted for still by the higher numbers of, of women who are undecided, even when pushed on how they're most likely to vote. Um, and just question mark, perhaps women are more put off than men by the, the, the term independence. So... We know that women are less in favour of independence than are men, but I think it's important when we're talking about the gender gap, and this is sometimes gets lost in, in sort of short clips of when, you, when you're talking about it because you, you tend to focus on the, on the key bits around the gap, but the fact that there are, first of all, plenty of women who do support independence, um, and I think sometimes discussions around this almost stray into women are all unionists and men are all nationalists, and clearly it's a lot more 
subtle picture than that. But secondly, that women are also as different from each other as they are from men. So talking about the gender gap in general might actually be hiding some important differences between different groups of women. So with that kind of latter point in mind, I've just got a, f a few slides taking a brief look at whether the gender gap seems to be more or less pronounced among particular groups in society. Um, and there's lots that I could have looked at here, and I'm sure other people might have suggestions of things I could look at in the future, but um, I've just focused on education and age, um, kind of following up on some of the findings from, from John and, and Lindsay's presentations this morning. So this first chart is showing the percentage of men and women um, in the different columns who are planning to vote yes, and this is after the question which asks the undecided how, which way they'd go if pushed by educa highest educational qualification as well as gender. And what you can see, if you look at the columns on the left-hand side, is that um, the, the gap is smallest among graduates. So the gender gap is smallest among graduates. It's only four percentage points compared with 19 percentage points among those whose highest qualification is, is at kind of upper secondary level. Um, we can't say from this that women graduates are significantly more likely to favor independence than women who aren't graduates. Um, because the differences are, are too small to be statistically significant. But what you can say is that the views of male and female graduates are less different from each other than are the views of uh, men and women who, who don't have higher education. And that's quite an interesting finding, partly because it hasn't always been the case. So this slide is using the longer standing question on independence, so we can go back and, and look a bit, a bit more over the longer time scale. And what you can see is that on the left-hand side, in 2011, there was a 15 percentage point difference in the proportion of men and women graduates who picked independence as their preferred option for how Scotland should be governed. Um, and by, by 2014, that gap pretty much disappeared and not significant. Um, and that seems to be largely because female graduates have warmed at least a little towards independence. So 20 percent of, of, of women graduates in 2011 supporting independence, up to 30 percent in, in 2014. Um, meanwhile, the views of male graduates don't seem to have shifted very much. They're pretty much the same in uh, the start of the, this graph and as, as at the end. The gender gap is also smaller among older voters compared with younger voters. So if you look at the bars on the, the right-hand side, this is showing the proportion who's saying they'll vote yes um, by age and by gender. And you can see that... 22% um, of women over 65, 26% of uh, me men over 65 say they'll vote yes. Actually, this is less to do with women, really, and more to do with men, because there's a big drop-off in support for a yes vote um, from the younger age groups to the oldest age group with men. Actually, there's much less difference um, by age um, among women. Given the focus, as a slight aside, given the focus on, on childcare in, in the campaign, um, I did also look at whether there was any difference in the views of, of women and men with and without children, um, but there weren't any statistically significant differences, and also the views of mothers looked very similar in 2013 and 2014, so to the extent that the uh, November 2013 white paper might have been anticipated that the promises in childcare would have a disproportionate impact on the views of, of mothers, um, I, I couldn't find any evidence for that having been the case. So we've seen that there's a big gender gap, although that gap is actually more apparent for some groups of society than others. Um, and obviously there's been lots of speculation over the last few years, um, particularly about what might explain this gap. Last year I tried, um, not entirely to my own satisfaction, or entirely successfully I have to say, to explain why that gender gap exists by looking at the areas where women might have a different outlook to men on, on issues that might affect whether or not they would vote yes. And I'm having another stab at that today, although if you were paying attention this morning um, in John's uh, presentation, uh, when you looked at the slide that showed all the different factors that seem to predict referendum vote, you will see that uh, gender remains significantly associated with referendum vote, even after you factor all sorts of other things in that might explain it. So don't get your hopes up for a magic answer. Um, but I hope that we can make some progress to at least explaining some of the reason for the, for the gender gap. And I'm going to look at three potential explanations, really. So first of all, we know from John's slides that um, people's views of the consequences of independence, and particularly the economic consequences, but also consequences for Scotland's voice in the world and so on, um, are very strongly related to how people intend to, to vote in September. So it could be that women just have substantially different expectations about the consequences of independence when compared with, with men. 
Second, it's, it's often suggested, as I mentioned earlier, that women are put off by Alex Salmon's manner and that um, the fact that he is perhaps less popular among women may be serving to also put women off independence, given how strongly associated he is with the, with the independence campaign. And third, although when we were looking at national identity this morning, um, I think John will probably point out that um, feeling Scottish is not necessarily sufficient uh, to, to prompt people to vote yes. It does seem to be a necessary condition, at least for, for, um, for, for a lot of people. Um, so it could be that women feel less strongly Scottish, and that might be why they're less inclined to, to, to say that they will vote yes. So looking at expectations first, just a very quick reminder on this slide of the, the areas that we, we looked at. And hopefully you've got the message by now that of these areas, it is the economy that matters by far the most. Um, and that's by far the most important factor in predicting whether or not people will, will vote yes uh, come September. And this is equally true of women and men. So if you analyse uh, their support uh, for a yes vote separately, then expectations about the economy still come out as the thing that, that seems to matter most to, to both men and women. So this table is showing on the left-hand side the proportion of women who think that things would either be better or worse um, across all these different areas if Scotland were to become independent. Right-hand side showing the same figures for men. Um, there's quite a lot of information to take out of this chart, so just to point out a few key things. First of all, women and men's expectations are actually very similar in relation to the impact of independence on Scotland's voice in the world, um, in relation to inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor, and also the impact on their own finances. In relation to the economy, y you might think from looking at the figures that it looks like women are a little less positive about the, the economic consequences but in fact, the difference in the, the proportion of men and women who say that um, Scotland's economy would be stronger if, if we were independent isn't statistically significant. So I wouldn't perhaps make too much of that. And also on the other side, you can see that actually in terms of the proportion who think Scotland's economy would be weaker, exactly the same proportion of women and men express that view. The only areas where there, there are significant differences are in relation to pride, where women are significantly less likely than men to think that independence would lead to some great upswing in national pride. Um, and also bank bailouts, where actually, if anything, women are slightly less pessimistic than men about the, the um, uh, potential ability of any future independent Scottish government to be able to bail out banks. So given the overall um, similarity of women and men's views across these areas, um, it's, it's unlikely that this explains uh, th that much of the gender gap. And in fact, when we put all these figures into a logistic regression, that, that confirms it. It, it reduces the gender gap very slightly, but it is very slightly. It's still highly significant. But what this slide doesn't show is the proportion of people who said that they weren't sure what the consequences of independence might be. And given that um, we know from John's slides that um, the, the certainty seems to matter and seems to, to have an impact, particularly for the yes vote. Um, maybe it is that women are just less, less certain what the impact's going to be on all these areas. And in fact, I'm going to come back and towards the end and, and look at the general question on, on how sure or unsure people are about the, the consequences of independence. But even looking at these more specific areas, you can see that there, there is some evidence that women seem more uncertain about what the impact's going to be. So particularly in relation to the economy, this is showing that the proportion of men and women who said they didn't know what, what, whether, whether things would be better, worse, or no different um, in, in 2012 to 2014. And you can see that on the economy in 2014, 19% of women saying that they don't know what the impact of independence on Scotland's economy would be compared with 10% of men. Um, similarly, 21% of women compared with 10% of men saying they don't know what the impact of independence would be in terms of the gap between rich and poor. Um, and there does seem to be some evidence that women are getting more rather than less unsure about the consequences over time. So on the economy, there's been a 7 percentage point increase since 2012. Um, in the proportion of women who say they don't know what the economic impacts will be. And as I say, I'll, I'll come back towards the end of this presentation to talk a little bit more about uncertainty. Moving on, as discussed, it's, it's quite often been suggested, um, and I think uh, Margaret Curran was talking about this in the papers um, just yesterday or the day before, that, that Alex Salmon's relative unpopularity with women compared with men might be a factor in the referendum. Um, and in SSA 2014, we, we asked everybody in our sample to score uh, both 
Alex Salmond and David Cameron on a scale from zero to 10 on how well they thought they were doing as first minister and prime minister. And you can see from the figures, this is showing the, the, the mean scores out of 10, that, that neither of them is all that tremendously popular these days. Um, but um, Salmond is still a little more popular overall than Cameron, although he's significantly less popular than when we last asked this in 2007, when I think he was getting ratings around 7, 8 out of 10. Um, but, and it is indeed the case, though, that, that Alex Salmond seems to be significantly less popular with women compared with men. So... Uh, mean scores 4.4 from women, 4.9 from men. But if Alex Salmon's relatively lower standing with women was what explained the gender gap, then what you would expect to see is that once you take how people rate Alex Salmon into account, um, the gender gap would pretty much disappear. And as this next chart shows, that's not in fact the case. So this chart is showing, it's quite complicated, it's quite a complicated chart because it's showing sort of three different things, but the proportion of men and women who would vote yes by how highly they rate Alex Salmond as First Minister. So what you can see is on the left-hand side, it's true that the gender gap does narrow a bit among those who don't rate Alex Salmond particularly highly, but it's still there, and it's particularly still there on the right-hand side among those who actually think Alex Salmond's doing a pretty good job as First Minister. So uh, the way I would interpret this is, you know, if even among those people who think that Alex Salmond's doing a pretty great job women are still less likely to say they would support independence than men are, then you can't, it's not really fair to blame Alex Salmond for the gender gap. It would most likely exist whether or not he, he, was, uh, he was so present in the campaign. Um, and in fact, if you look over the longer time period, and this is something that I did last year, the gender gap exists even in years when Alex Salmond wasn't actually leader of the SNP and was perhaps much uh, less in the, in the um, public, in terms of public profile, his, that was less. So. I think, while it's probably true that you wouldn't pick Alex Salmond necessarily to get the Yes campaign's message across to women in particular, um, it's not really entirely fair uh, to blame him for the fact that women are less supportive of independence. So, final hypothesis that I mentioned earlier is that perhaps women feel less Scottish than, than do men. Um, and there does, although it's, it's a often slightly exaggerated, um, seem to be an association between feeling Scottish and supporting independence. But you can see from this chart that, again, this isn't the case. So this chart is showing for various different years the proportion of men and women who said on the Moreno scale that they feel either Scottish, not British, or more Scottish than British. And you can see that, really, there's, there's no difference between men and women on this um, uh, the difference in 2014 wasn't significant, but, it, but if anything, actually, you know, women are a little more likely to say that they feel uh, more Scottish than British. But um, you might remember this from, from John, the discussion around John Size this morning, that um, an alternative hypothesis around identity is that actually how Scottish you feel doesn't really matter. What matters is how British you feel, and that's what will, will affect how you might vote in, in September. Um, and indeed, um, from looking at our data, there does seem to be some evidence that, that, that that's the case, that actually looking at Scottish identity is the, the wrong thing to be looking at if you're trying to understand how national identity might play into the debate. And there is some evidence that women do feel uh, at least a bit more British than do men. So this is, is showing how women and men place themselves on this seven-point scale, which asks... Uh, which goes from one, which is not really British at all, seven, which is uh, very British, I guess. Um, and you can see roughly from this that there seems to be rather more women than men or towards the right-hand side of that scale. And if you look at the mean scores, then in fact you do find that the, the mean score for women is uh, 4.6, which is significantly higher than the mean score of 4.3 for men. So it's not dramatic differences, but it, but it is there. Um, but again, if that explained the gender gap, then you would expect that once you take account of these different, uh, of, of how British people feel, the gender gap wouldn't exist. Um, and again, that doesn't entirely seem to be the case. So, so this chart is showing the proportion of people who say they will vote yes <coughs> by how British they feel on the scale and also by gender. And you can see that although the gender gap is much smaller for those who feel most British, among those who don't feel particularly British, the gender gap is, is still apparent. So you've probably gathered by now that the gender gap is not only persistent over time, it's quite difficult to explain. Um, and this slide uh, uses a bit of statistical modelling to try and illustrate that. So basically this is summarising uh, the, the key findings from a series of logistic regression models I uh, uh, carried out, which um, 
included gender alongside various of these different things that you might think might help to get rid of the gender gap. Um, and on the right-hand side, you've got the p-value of gender in all of these models. Um, and uh, in survey terms, a p-value of less than 0 0.05 is highly statistically significant. Um, so if you just look at gender on its own, you can see p-value of 0.08, very, very significant. Um, and you can see that adding in all these various things to the model doesn't, does reduce that p-value a little bit, but it doesn't get it below 0 0.05. It's still, it's still highly significant, even after you include all of these various factors. So while all these factors seem to reduce the gender gap a bit, it is only a bit, and there's clearly something else going on that accounts for the fact that, that women are less likely to say they will vote yes. So what about uncertainty? I said I would come back and look at that. And you may remember from John's slides that we asked a, a general question, which was how sure or unsure do you feel about um, how, what independence would be like, whether, whether good or bad? Um, and you can see from this that, in fact, women are less sure what independence would mean than men. So 27% of women compared with 37% of men saying they're either very or quite sure what an independence fund would be like. As John alluded to this morning, though, it's quite difficult to see the impact of certainty on its own. You really have to look at um, certainty along with people's expectations about the economy or one of these other areas, because, of course, people could be sure that things will be great or people could be sure that things will be awful. So this next slide is, is looking at... at all of these things together say so it's looking at the proportion of women and men who say they will vote yes by certainty combined with their economic expectations, which is a bit of a complicated chart. Um, but what you can see is that among those who think that Scotland's economy would be better and who feel sure about what an independent Scotland will, be look, will look like, almost all women and almost all men say that they will vote yes. So the gender gap's pretty much disappeared. Um, it's also pretty much disappeared among those who think that uh, the economy will either be no different or it will be worse and are pretty sure that it, it will be negative. Um, there is still a bit of a gender gap among those who th are still unsure about the consequences, but it is less than the overall gap, at least, of, of 11 or 12 points. So, again, not perfect, but it does seem to, to, to have some impact. And in terms of um, statistical modelling, once you add uncertainty, economic expectations, and the interaction between uncertainty and economic expectations into the statistical sausage machine, as John likes to call it, um, you can see that the gender gap does actually finally reduce to below 0 0.05, which is what I've been trying to do for the last uh, year and a half. Um, so, so for the Yes campaign, the challenge is not only to persuade more women of the positive case for independence, but also to engender greater certainty about that positive case. So it needs to be really persuasive, not just a kind of, on balance it might be better, but I'm not too sure. Um, but the difficulty in that is that we're not getting that much more certain. Um, there's been a, a bit of a reduction in the proportion of women and men who feel unsure about what independence will mean since 2013, but given these figures, it's likely that yes is going to need a bigger shift if they want to catch a more of the undecided, including the, 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 the large group of women who seem to still be undecided. So, very briefly in conclusion, long-standing and persistent gender gap, but that's smaller among graduates and among older people. Um, uh, in the former <coughs> case, that's a result of a, a shift towards independence among women graduates since 2011. Um, views of the consequences of independence, views of Salmon's um, Britishness, all contribute a little to explaining the gender gap, but uh, the thing that seems to be the more important is the greater uncertainty among women about the consequences. Mm -hmm.